This week in China, there was a terrible earthquake. Maybe 50,000 people have died, and some 5 million people are, are homeless. 5 million people homeless would be about 1 in 10 people in Britain homeless. And when we think about this, there's a real danger that we can think, I hope this doesn't happen to me. I hope this wouldn't happen to me one day. But that, I don't think, is a biblical response. It's actually a distraction from the proper biblical response. That's why this sermon is called, Don't Be Distracted. A couple of weeks ago, right outside here, someone tried to shoot someone and someone stabbed someone. And we can think about that and think, I hope that doesn't happen to me. And I would say that can be a distraction from how we're really supposed to think when we hear about wars and rumors of wars. And no doubt there will be a war based on what happened two weeks ago. So today's about not being distracted from the proper, proper biblical response to these terrible things that happen in this age of suffering. And to find out what the proper response is, going to look at Matthew 24 verse 29 which says immediately after the tribulation of those days the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken so let's pray Jesus I pray that we would not be distracted now As we look at your word, I pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. Speak to us through your word. Guide us. Correct us. Change our hearts as we look at your word so that we are not distracted by these things that happen in this age, in this week, in this last month. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's look at this text. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. Now to understand this, open up your Bible because we've been in Matthew 24 for quite a few weeks. And so you want to make sure you're getting how this chapter pans out. Matthew 24, starting at verse 4 and going all the way through to verse 28, I believe is describing the last days. Well, really up to verse 26, because verse 27 actually talks about Jesus coming. So that whole period there describes the last days. And we've seen how the last days are the time in between Jesus's first coming and Jesus's second coming, which is sometimes called the inter-advent period. And during that time, Jesus says there's going to be spiritual deception. There's going to be persecution of Christians there's going to be wars, there's going to be earthquakes, and there's going to be famines. And most of these verses describe these things in very general terms, in very generic terms that you can't really tie to one specific place or one specific time. And you see these things happen in the first century, the second century, the third century, and even now. And you see them happen in different countries. So Jesus talks in very vague terms that seems to just describe the general characteristics of these last days. However, if you look at verse 15, where he says, so when you see the abomination of desolation, verses 15 to 22 seem to describe a specific thing that happens during these last days. And if you look at the description, it's very specific and very geographical. It's clearly applied to Judea and to Jerusalem. You can't apply it to London. It's clearly applied to that place. And we've seen how that actually happened in AD 70. So we got most of this chapter talking about the, the last days, what they're going to be like. We've got a few verses in the middle that say when this particular thing happens, watch out, you need to flee. And then it goes back to describing those last days. And that brings us into verse 29, where it says, immediately after the tribulation of those days. 
verse 29. And I believe that verse 29 here is saying immediately after the tribulation of the last days, immediately after all this distress that Jesus has just described, immediately after the distress of Christians being persecuted, wars, famines, all that kind of stuff. And the word there for tribulation, as you probably worked out, is the Greek word thalipsis, which was used back in verse 9 to speak of persecution of Christians, and was used in verse 21, not to speak of persecution of Christians, but to speak of the war between the Romans and the Jews, and there it was called great tribulation. And now in verse 29, I believe it's talking about the general distress of this age. I'm not going to spend more time on that. If you want to find out more, I'm writing a very large paper on it at the moment, 7,000 word paper. If you want to read that when it's done, you can by all means, but we're not going to look at that further today. The point I want to make is that the present age, this present age of distress will come to an end. The distress we're living in at the moment with earthquakes, famines, persecution, apostasy, wars, even wars on the street will come to an end one day. That's good news, isn't it? And Jesus says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Now, if you was a Jew living in Jesus' time, if you was one of the disciples hearing this, what would you think of? What would it mean to you? Well, it's language from the Old Testament. It's language that's used in Isaiah, it's used in Ezekiel, and it's used in Joel. And I'll give you one example. God uses this when he talks about the destruction of Babylon in the 6th century B.C. Isaiah 13.1. Now this is prophesied in the 7th century and it's about something that's going to happen in the 6th century B.C. The oracle concerning Babylon. Then verse 3. I have summoned my mighty men to execute my anger. Verse 9. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising and the moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And in verse 17, Behold, I am stirring up the meads against them who have no regard for silver and do not delight in gold. Their bows will slaughter the young men. They will have no mercy on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes will not pity children. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the splendor and pomp of the Chaldeans will be like Sodom and Gomorrah when God overthrew them. So the disciples in Jesus' day would have grown up here in this passage. And in this passage in verse 10, it talks about stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising and the moon will not shed its light. So they'll be familiar with this terminology, which we will call cosmic disturbances, strange things happening with the sun, moon, and stars. And when they hear this terminology, they're going to think of passages like this, and they're going to think about war, death, slaughter, and judgment. That's what this passage is all about. It's about the Babylonians being fought against by their enemies and being slaughtered. It's about horrific war. So when Jesus says immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken, the first thing probably it's going to pop into their mind is war and slaughter and destruction and judgment. But that's not all they're going to think of. And this is where it gets a bit tricky. You've really got to pay attention for this. Look at verse 1. It says, the oracle concerning Babylon. So who is this about? Babylon. Now look at verse 10. You've got 
cosmic disturbances. It says, for the stars of the heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising and the moon will not shed its light. And then verse 11, I will punish the world for its evil. What's verse 11 talking about? The world. So Isaiah 13 starts off talking about Babylon and judgment that's going to come on Babylon. And then if you go to verse 17, it says, Behold, I am stirring up the Medes against them. So the judgment against Babylon is going to be through another people called the Medes. And the Medes are going to come and fight against Babylon and destroy them. There's your war and your slaughter. Judgment on Babylon in the 6th century BC, that's 2,600 years ago. And then in verse 11, God says, I will punish the world for its evil. That's a bit confusing, isn't it? He's talking about punishing Babylon, and he goes straight from talking about punishing Babylon to punishing the world, and then he goes back to talking about publishing, publishing, sorry, punishing. There's no publishing at all in this text. Punishing, sorry, punishing Babylon. So, what this means, I think, is that when God talks about pouring his judgment on Babylon, that judgment, that slaughter that happens to Babylon is a preview. It's a preview of when God is going to judge the whole world in the future. So God is going to punish Babylon. He did it 2,600 years ago, and it was horrific. And that was a preview of years later when God judges the whole world. And the way he describes that in verse 10 is, For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising, and the moon will not shed its light. So, when the disciples heard about Jesus saying immediately after the stress of those days, there will be cosmic disturbances. When the disciples hear that, they think of war and slaughter, but they also think about the great day of the Lord at the end when God is going to destroy all his enemies. They would think of judgment at the very end when the whole world will be judged and that the destruction of Babylon was just a preview of that. So what I'm saying here is one day after the distress of this age, there will be a cataclysmic judgment that everything else has only previewed. There will be a cataclysmic judgment, a severely violent judgment that everything else in the history of the world has only been a preview of. Just like when you go to the cinema, you see at the beginning previews of films. You'll get a 30 second preview of what a whole 90 minute film is going to be about. And in the same way, in AD 70, when Jerusalem was surrounded by the Romans and it was under siege, and you had women eating their own children because they were so hungry, you had people killing one another, horrific things happening, that was just a preview of the end. World War I, can you believe it? It was just a preview of the end. World War II was just a preview of the end. Think about World War II. Where people are just getting letters saying, you've got to go off to fight. Men were having to leave their children behind and their wives behind and go off to fight and die. Think of in the trenches in World War I where men had broomsticks and they had to climb out of those trenches and run towards men with machine guns who mowed them down. Think of Hiroshima in World War II, an atomic bomb being dropped and people being destroyed just like that. Think of the Holocaust. All these things are just previews, tiny little previews of what is going to happen at the end. The judgment that is coming is far worse than anything we've seen. Think of China. Did anyone see videos of it on the news? Absolutely horrific what's happened in China. You see these pictures where just all the buildings have been toppled and there's people underneath those buildings. 
who are gasping for air right now. That is a preview of the judgment that is going to come. And so it's very important that we get that these judgments we see happen in, in this day, when Jesus' kingdom is growing, but there's other people competing with their own kingdom, and so Jesus will let kingdom rise against kingdom and destroy one another, and the world is in turmoil because Jesus' kingdom's here, and the world says, we don't want his kingdom. We took it to fruit in the Garden of Eden. We want sin. We want to be God instead of God. So the world is in chaos right now because it doesn't accept Jesus' lordship and his kingdom. And all these judgments that are going on right now are previews of what's going to happen at the end. And when we don't view it that way, we're getting distracted. And that is the danger of distraction. For example, we hear about China and we think, I hope that doesn't happen to us. I hope that one day we don't have a terrible earthquake in London. Soon as we think like that, we're getting distracted. We're not viewing what's happened in a biblical way. Instead, we're supposed to think, what's happened in China is a preview of something much worse that is coming upon the whole world. And so, our attitude, first off, should be repentance. We first hear about earthquake in China, cyclone in Burma. First thought should be repentance. This is what Jesus said in Luke 13, starting at verse 1. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. So there's been some Galileans, something terrible has happened to them, and the A Roman governor has mixed their blood with sacrifices. And in verse 2, well, basically they're thinking, well, what's that all about, Jesus? Just like today when there's disasters, people in the news say, where was God? And in verse 2, Jesus answered them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? Verse 3, Jesus says, no. That's interesting, isn't it? You hear about China, you hear about Burma. Some people think, ah, well, they're worse than us. Look at the Chinese, they persecute Christians. Look at the Burmese, they persecute Christians. They're worse than us. That's why the judgments come. Not actually how Jesus is encouraging us to think here. He says, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So so Jesus, you get the impression if he was here now and we were talking about China and Burma, he would say, unless you repent, unless you turn from your sin and turn to me, then you too will perish. And that's why I'm saying that the judgments we see happen now are previews of the big judgment that's going to come on the whole world. So when we hear about China, instead of thinking, oh, I hope that doesn't happen to me, instead we must say, Unless I repent and trust in Jesus Christ, a worse thing will happen to me one day. And then in verse 4 he says, All those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them. So there was a disaster here. A building fell and killed 18 people. Just like in China, loads of these buildings, loads of these school buildings have fallen and crushed children. It's absolutely horrific. And he says, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? And he says, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So the people who didn't get crushed by buildings in China, they're not now supposed to think, oh, the people who did are worse than me. Instead, they're supposed to think, I need to repent. I need to be right with God. That's how we need to think. We need to make sure we're not distracted from that way of thinking. We know that God's judgment's coming, so we run to Jesus for safety. Because immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Now there's debate about whether this is metaphorical language or if this is actually what's really going to happen 
And there, there are times in the Old Testament where this terminology is used to talk of real battles that happened. So we know that it's metaphorical, yet at the same time it could well be literal because Christ is coming back. It's going to be an amazing event, the end of this age, and the heavens and the earth are going to be destroyed. So it quite possibly is a real literal thing that's going to happen as well. But I don't actually see how discussing whether it's literal or metaphoric really helps us that much. I think what we need to do is see what did the other New Testament writers say about this and make our applications from that. So let's look at Revelation. You may have noticed in the last few weeks, Matthew 24 is very similar to Revelation 6. You've got these seals being opened that I believe are being opened as a result of Jesus' victory and his resurrection. And you get to the fifth seal, Revelation 6, 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw, and, and remember before this, you've had famine, you've had war, you've had death, just like in Matthew 24. And then it says, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. So right here you've got martyrs, Christians who have died. Just like Christians who have been killed in China for being Christians and in Burma and in Turkey and many other places. Verse 10, they cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So they know that one day God is going to avenge their blood. And they say, how long, Lord? Then verse 12, it seems in response to what the martyrs have asked. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked. And behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth. And the full moon became like blood. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit. When shaken by a gale, the sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. So here we have Christian martyrs crying out to God saying, when will you avenge our blood? And then in what appears to be response to that, you get these cosmic disturbances. And these cosmic disturbances are a sign that the people who have persecuted Christians will be judged because persecuting God's messengers is the same as persecuting God remember when Saul was on the road to Damascus in Acts 9 4 Jesus says Saul Saul why do you persecute me what had Saul been doing he'd been persecuting the church and Jesus says why do you persecute me and many times in scripture we see that how you treat Jesus' messengers is how you treat Jesus. And rejecting God's messengers is the same as rejecting God. And we see a similar thought in Paul's writings in 2 Thessalonians 1.6. He says, God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you. Here it's from the word thelipsis again. Affliction, those who afflict you. And to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. This is talking about when Jesus comes back at the end of the age and notice he's linking two things up there. He starts off in verse 6 talking about God putting vengeance on the people who've been bad to the Christians. But then in verse 8, he says, those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So how people respond to Christians is linked with how they respond to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the point here is that God will punish those who do not obey his gospel. That can happen in the way that people refuse to repent when they read the Bible. It can also happen in the way that people, when a Christian comes to them and gives them the gospel... They make fun of them, they ignore them, they put them in prison, 
they kill them. They're rejecting God's gospel. They're not obeying his gospel. His gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ died and rose again. And the correct response to that is to repent and turn to Jesus and believe in him. But when people don't do that, they're awaiting terrible judgment at the end. And it's so important that people don't get distracted from this. Because right now in China, I'm sure there are some police in Beijing who have been wrongfully arresting Christians. And right now they're saying, oh, I hope an earthquake never hits Beijing. And they're being distracted because what they should be thinking is just as that earthquake hit Beijing, I too will suffer one day for how I have treated God's people and how I have not obeyed his gospel. Similarly, in Turkey, people who have been persecuting Christians there be hearing about China right now and hearing about Burma and thinking, oh, I hope that never happens in Turkey. And they're being distracted because instead they need to say, The same will happen to me if I do not repent and run to Jesus for safety. And in the same way, there's people in England who have rejected the gospel and maybe have even laughed at you. And there's people in Africa who maybe have laughed at you when you told them the gospel. And they now hear about this earthquake and they think, I hope that doesn't happen to me one day. But instead, they need to think, that will happen to me one day if I don't turn to Jesus. And on that day, there will be cosmic disturbances and no one will be able to hide. As it says in Revelation, following on from that text, starting at verse 14. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free. So that's talking about everyone, yeah? Middle class, upper class, working class, wherever you're from, even slaves. Everyone hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. Call into the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? In China right now, people are hidden under rocks, hoping that people will find them, that these rocks will be removed. China is nothing compared to the end. At the end, people will want rocks to be hiding them. They won't want people pulling them out because they will want to hide from God, but they won't be able to hide from God. This is important because people go through their whole life hiding sin. All of us in this room do it. In case you're thinking you don't, what if I told you I've got some new technology here and we can hook a monitor up, put it on top of your head, And as you walk around the rest of the day, we see all your thoughts on the screen. I'm sure no one would want to volunteer to do that, myself included. We all know how to fake things. We know how to fake good deeds. We know how to fake being a good person. Some people even know how to fake being a Christian. But one day when these cosmic disturbances happen, all our works will be laid bare before God. And we'll no longer be able to fake. And people will long to hide from God, but they won't be able to. <clears throat> As Peter says, Second Peter 3.10, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar. And the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. And the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed so one day everything we've done will be exposed everything we've done will be exposed for what it truly is thanks so if we notice we stop ourselves getting distracted When we hear about the earthquake in China, we will think, 
Oh dear, one day something much worse than that will happen. That's a preview of what's going to happen one day when my works will be exposed for what they truly are. Whenever I've pretended to be more holy than I am, whenever I've pretended to have good motives when I've really had bad motives, that will be exposed. Anything I've done that I've made out I was doing for God, but really I was doing it for myself, that will be exposed. And this will cause us to repent and seek Jesus' forgiveness and run to him for safety. This is the good news. On the one hand, it's terrifying. One day all our works will be exposed. On the other hand, we can run to Jesus, ask for forgiveness and be forgiven by him and be clothed with his righteousness. So that on that day when everything's exposed, you can stand before God knowing that you have Christ's righteousness so that God will say, not guilty. That is good news. That is really good news. That means we don't have to fear these cosmic disturbances that happen at the end. We don't have to fear that if we have Christ. And knowing that, we will then seek to work for Christ out of gratitude of his salvation to prepare ourselves for the wedding of the Lamb to clothe ourselves with good deeds having already known that we are clothed in his righteousness and to do everything centered on Christ Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3.11 for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on a foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it. Because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. When an earthquake hits your town and everything is destroyed, your house is destroyed, you have nothing left. You may have seen these poor people on the videos, walking with all the other refugees now, just walking, hoping to find some place they can live. They have nothing left. Don't even have a bowl to put food in, let alone food. Everything has been stripped from their life. This should be a preview to us that one day when Jesus returns, we will stand bare before God. Anything we've built up in our life that's not based on Christ won't be there anymore. All that will remain is anything that was built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. There must be so many things we've built up in our lives that are just going to come to nothing on that day. On that day, only Christ's kingdom will be left standing. That's what Matthew's all about, Christ's kingdom. And on that day, only Christ's kingdom is going to be left standing. And there will even, if you look at verse 15, there will be people who are saved, Christians, but their work will be burned up. It says, if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. That could be talking about us. God may save us because of Christ's righteousness, because of the work Christ did on the cross. However, we may find that almost everything we did in our life wasn't really based on Christ. We may find that the job we did we just did it for ourselves. We didn't do it to glorify Christ. We may find that we only did evangelism to try and impress people about how our lives had changed and how much better a person we were. We may find that the degree we did was just to glorify ourselves rather than to glorify Christ. We may find that the Bible studies we went to was just to show off and to learn more rather than to obey Christ better. We may find that the way we worship God was just to have fun and not actually to glorify 
Christ. And so we must not let ourselves be distracted. And when we hear about these earthquakes, we must take this as a warning and know that one day this will happen in an even greater scale and only Christ's kingdom will be left standing. As Hebrews 12, 26 says, At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. This is talking about the first time God shook the law at Mount Sinai. Sorry, the first time he shook the earth at Mount Sinai. There was a theophany, an appearance of God. And if you remember your Old Testament, the people were too afraid. They didn't actually want God to speak to them. They wanted Moses to go and speak to God. Instead, they were so afraid at God's might and power and his holiness when he gave them the law. And then God shook the earth again when Christ came and Christ gave us the gospel. And now we're living in that period where the kingdom has come and yet we're in this funny overlapping period where we're still in the old age at the same time. The old age and the new age are overlapping and it's a time of shaking. Nation rising against nation, famine, earthquake. And at the very end there will be a great shaking where nothing will be left except Christ and his kingdom. Anything in our life that hasn't been centered around Christ and his kingdom, his gospel, will not be left. So don't be distracted. Devote your life to Christ now and his gospel and be a servant of his kingdom. Live a life of repentance, doing Bible study, telling others the gospel, giving to gospel ministries. Think about your time. How, how are we spending our time when we come home from work? How are we spending our time at work? How are we spending our paycheck? Is it all centered around Christ and his gospel, or is it centered around us? So to sum up, one day there will be a cataclysmic judgment. All judgments we've seen on the earth so far are mere previews of what's going to happen. So when we see these judgments, we need to repent. We need to realize that one day the whole world will face such a judgment, and all our works will be exposed for what they are. Only that which is centered in Christ will remain. So don't be distracted. Center your life on Christ and serve him. Let's pray. Jesus, looking at your kingdom, looking at your might and your power and your holiness, looking at the things that happen now in this age, looking at the terrible earthquakes and cyclones, it's frightening to think of when you come back. And so we put our hope in you this morning. We say, Jesus, forgive us of our sin. We turn from our sin, we turn to you, and we trust you to save us. We want to come under your wing, Jesus, and be protected by you. We want your righteousness, because we know that we will fail in devoting our lives to you. So we pray for your righteousness that declares us not guilty and righteous. And we also pray, Holy Spirit, that you would equip us today and give us a passion to be dedicated to Christ. We can't do it. We pray that you would give us the grace to serve Christ, to center our lives on Christ, so that everything is centered on him, his kingdom, and the gospel, so that on that great day where things are shaken, that we would see much that remains because it was centered on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Anyone got any questions? Yeah. Yeah, if you look at, um, if you turn to Romans 1, so the question is, are these natural disasters God's wrath. God's wrath is God's anger against sin. 
And if you look at um, Romans 1, verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So it right there says that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. And then, if you go down to verse 24, Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity. So, so right there you've got Paul saying that God's wrath is revealed from heaven against ungodliness, and a manifestation of this is God giving people up to their own lusts. So when you have soldiers that come to a village and kill people and take young boys and make them kill their parents, that is a horrific thing those people are doing and it's their own lusts that want to do that and God is giving them up to their lusts. They want to live a world without God being their king and God gives them up to that lust and lets them enjoy that lust. Um, obviously, in this text here, it talks about, goes on to talk about homosexuality. But then it also, in verse 29, says, They are filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. It goes on. So it seems to me that it wouldn't just apply to homosexuality, but it would apply to a number of things. And similarly with earthquakes, that would be God's judgment because the world now is at loggerheads with God. Because Christ's kingdom has broken in, the world is in bondage, and we see that in Romans as well about the world being in bondage and waiting for its redemption. So it's all because the world is in sin and is not right with God. That doesn't mean that when soldiers come to a village and kill people, God is to blame. The Bible is clear, the people are to blame. And when the earthquakes happen, again, it's not God is to blame. We are to blame because we brought sin into the world at the Garden of Eden. We are the ones who actually set this in motion by choosing to reject our king and say we would run things in Eden and that is why there are earthquakes. So it all comes down to man. It's our fault and these things are judgment of God. At the same time, God is so loving that he then sends his son into the, to the earth and pours out judgment on his own son so that his people, the ones who turn to Jesus Christ, would not have to face God's wrath. Exactly. We don't for one second think, oh, we are better than China. Instead, we're like, we are sinners. We're in Adam. We need to repent and we need to get in Christ so that we are safe from the wrath. We're no better than China. England has its own sins. Yeah, and so I think when a non-Christian says to you, oh, why did God let this cyclone happen? It's a good opportunity to say, well, why did God let that cyclone happen? There must be a reason. Why would a good God let something horrific like that happen? And then take it down to an easier to understand human level. Why would the Prime Minister of Britain send thousands of soldiers to another country to start shooting people with machine guns. Why would that happen? That, that normally only happens, depending on what country you're in, it normally only happens if someone has done something evil and you need to now pour judgment out on evil. So think of World War II. I don't think many people would have a problem with the Prime Minister sending British troops over to fight Hitler. Hitler was doing something evil. Now, someone could say, well, why are the British firing machine guns? That's terrible. Why does the Prime Minister let him do that? Well, he's doing that because he needs to take a stand against evil. And similarly, God takes a stand against evil. And he sees that the world is evil. And so he allows these cyclones to happen and these earthquakes to happen because there's sin in the world. And he's pouring his judgment out and he's saying, this is a preview. 
it's going to be much worse. You need to repent. People in China, people in the whole world, look at what just happened in China. This is a preview. This shows you the world is not right with God. You need to repent because one day it's going to be worse. And he's delaying things because he doesn't want any of his people to perish. He wants us to repent. So there's actually great love in the cyclone and in China because God could have just said last week, enough, the whole world is destroyed. And instead he says, I'm going to give you a foretaste of what's going to happen. There's still time. I want you to repent. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's, that's the essence of Matthew 24. You know, if, if you remember back a few weeks ago, when does the end come? When, when the gospel, it says in verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So the, the timing of the end is seriously linked up with the gospel being preached to all the nations. So I look at us and I think, why has God put us in this nation, which is wealthy, that doesn't have persecution, knowing that the whole plan is for the gospel to go out to all the nations. God's put us in this situation to play our part in the gospel going out to all the nations. And that's what it's all about. You see the cyclone and everything and we say, okay, we need to preach the gospel to all the nations.